right now. you're here with us today. It's kind of strange that we're all singing on Easter Sunday morning from our living room to our kitchens, maybe our front or back porch. But I encourage you to lift your voices high this morning as we celebrate that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Y'all sing out now. Christ the Guys, my name is Mike Norris. I am the youth director here at St. John's, and I'm here to give you the announcements of what's going on around St. John's. 
uh, weekdays, we have uh, the word of the day at four o'clock. Um, be there on Facebook page, our Facebook group page, and you'll be able to see that there. Also, as you go out, we have the group, uh, the group call-in prayer meeting um, at 9.45 on Sundays and on Wednesdays at six o'clock. You get to call in and talk to uh, the pastor and have your prayer meeting. That number is 863-535-4643. I apologize about that. It's 863-535-4643 or 863-53-KINGS3, and you'll be able to see that. We also have, uh, as we're going through uh, each day and each week, I know we're going through a uh, massive pandemic and we're not be able to go around very much, but we are still doing things here at St. John's. And it gives you an opportunity to continue to provide for the resources that we are doing here as your tithe and offerings come in and you're uh, able to give and give through the offerings and your gifts. You could do that by going to stjohnswh.com and give, or uh, forward slash give, or you can go to our website and click give, and that'll take you there as well. Or you can actually call in by phone and pledge by phone, and that's 863-588-7376. We just ask that you continue to provide as much as you can, when you can, that we can continue providing these resources for you. So let's continue to worship together and give thanks to God for all he is doing through St. John's today. Thank you very much. Have a blessed Easter. St. John's, it's good to be with you on this beautiful Easter morning. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I want to really thank you because many of you this week sent in an offering for our preschool. This was our special Easter offering and appeal that many of you received a letter in your homes and you have responded. And we're anticipate checks continuing to come in in the next couple days. So thank you so much for all you've given and all you do to support St. John's through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your witness, and your service. Next week, we anticipate that more children will start returning and more parents will have need of child care. But we ask for your continued prayers for our preschool ministry and for our preschool teachers and for our preschool director and children's director, Amanda Green. As we go to the Lord in prayer, we not only remember our preschool, but we remember our nation, our leaders, we remember those who are suffering with the COVID-19 illness, those who are suffering from loneliness, those who are stuck at home, bored, or who's stuck at home and are overwhelmed by having to manage their work from home, their children, or even manage their household and their chores. Whatever it may be, and whatever you're feeling right now, we go to the Lord in prayer and offer this to the Lord in prayer. I also want to encourage you to continue to send your prayer requests uh, to me by email, and if you allow, uh, I do post them on our Facebook group. So I would encourage you not only to like our Facebook page, but to join our Facebook prayer uh, group and you will see many prayer requests that have been answered so far because of you praying where you are. So let us go to the Lord in prayer and give thanks. Almighty God, I give you thanks and praise, O Lord. You have raised Christ for us. It is a resurrected Christ, O Lord, that sits at your right hand that rules and reigns over all the universe. And he is the second Adam, Lord, a new chance and a new opportunity for us to be a part of the new creation as one of his brothers and as one of your children. We come to you, O oh Lord, this day in prayer. We have many prayer requests on our hearts, and we lift them up to you. May they be a fragrant offering to you, and may the offerings that we give, O oh Lord, be fragrant to you, pleasing in your sight. And we ask that you would multiply them for the sake of your kingdom, that all might know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it is in his name that we pray the way that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's give that another try. When I say Christ is risen, you say he is risen indeed. Christ is risen. I couldn't hear you that time. Let's try it again. Christ is risen. That was much better. Glad we could participate together. So this morning, we have a real treat for you. 
thanks to the miracle of technology, uh, our bishop in our annual conference, Ken Carter, is going to share the Easter message this morning. He's encouraged churches to use his message as they would like for Easter morning. Since you've heard me all week on the word of the day, or maybe not, but you can go back and look at some of the word of day, the day that I've done, or you listen to me on Good Friday, I wanted to share his message with you today. It's particularly applicable to the COVID-19 pandemic that's going on. And if you contrast that with the life that Christ offers through the resurrection, we are Easter people, and we have hope because Christ is risen. Hear now this account from the Matthew's Gospel about Christ's resurrection, beginning in chapter 28, going from verse 1 to 10. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds this reading of his holy word. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God for the people of God. And you may respond, thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers of the Florida Conference, in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Ken Carter. It's my honor to serve as the Bishop of the Florida Conference, and it is a particular privilege to share this Easter message with you. The title of this message is Easter COVID-19 and the Contradiction of Resurrection Faith. The law did not allow them to come to the place of his burial on the Sabbath. And so the women arrive as soon as practically possible on the first day of the week with spices to anoint his body. They expect the tomb to be closed, but it's open. And they expect to find the body, but it's not there. Understandably, Luke tells us they were perplexed, confused. In the message translation, they are puzzled. Suddenly, the women encounter two men, angels maybe, and they're terrified. Their impulse is to bow to the ground. Fear is a common thread that runs throughout the gospel accounts of the resurrection. The Greek word is phobos, from which we get our word phobia. We're told six times in the four Gospels that the witnesses to the resurrection are filled with fear. This is in part that they're disoriented in the face of this unexpected event, but it's more. It's a sense of the holy. The biblical translator Eugene Peterson connected this to the first proverb, the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Something profound is happening. In a time of radical change, everything shifts. We are appropriately fearful, and yet we are most open to transition to insight. God has our attention. Matthew's 
story that got shared about the resurrection said it was like an earthquake. God has our attention. It's a wake-up call and not simply because this is early in the morning. We're awakened of all that had come before. And this has everything to do with Good Friday. We had been living or sleepwalking through a Good Friday world. And there's this interruption, this reversal and our response in the language of Scripture is fear of the Lord. Do not be afraid. He's not here. He's risen. The stranger goes on, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Don't you remember what he taught you in Galilee? Let's pause for a moment and note the presence of women in the gospel at the resurrection, in the ministry of Jesus. Luke, in his telling of the story, is careful of the details. Why? Because this is the word of God. This is promise and fulfillment. Luke gives us the names of the women. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James. Earlier in this gospel, chapter 8, verse 2, we learn that the disciples are with Jesus along with the women who had been recipients of his healing ministry. And they're also named Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and many others. It's essential to note that women were in the inner circle of Jesus' disciples from the very beginning. They were present as Jesus taught the disciples. They were engaged in every important act of his ministry. They were present at his crucifixion. They followed his body as it was taken to the tomb. And they are with him on the first Easter. A fascinating aside. In this time and place, women were not deemed trustworthy to testify in court. More than one scholar has noted that it would have been hard to imagine why a writer would have women discovering the empty tomb unless that is what actually happened. And because they had been with him all along, the women remembered it helps that Jesus is a master teacher. Think of his two best known parables the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son. In the first story, a man is beaten, a Samaritan shows compassion, the man is healed. In the second story, a child is lost, and in returning home, he's embraced by the parent, the child is restored. These parables prepare us for an even more crucial story. A good man, a righteous man is executed. He is dead, he's buried. But when they go to care for him, he's not there. He has been raised from the dead. At the heart of these teachings lies a contradiction. Something happens that we were not expecting. For the women on the first Easter, it was a puzzle and it remains so for many of us to this day. To observe Easter in the midst of a global pandemic is a contradiction. This is not how we expected to celebrate Easter. In Holy Week, we reflected on the importance of the cross and on Good Friday in many churches, we would traditionally drape the cross, a, a symbol of death. On this Easter morning, we celebrate the assurance of life in the midst of death, even the victory of life over death. All of this, in the words of Parker Palmer, is a dynamic contradiction. Parker, Parker Palmer writes, the cross represents the way in which the world contradicts God. We yearn for light and truth and goodness to appear among us, 
And when they come in human form, the world grows fearful and kills the incarnation. But then the cross represents the way in which God contradicts the world. No matter how often the world says no, God is present with an eternal yes, bringing light out of darkness, hope out of despair, life out of death. He is not here. He is risen. We see the continuity of the cross through the entire life and ministry of Jesus. We see the arms of the cross reaching down to heal the wounded man walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. Are we providing the care in that story or are we being made well? We feel the arms of the cross embracing the rebellious child. Are those our arms or are, are those the arms of someone else enfolding us? We hear the teacher's voice saying to the criminal, today you'll be with me in paradise, saying about the enemy's father, forgive them. What do these stories, the good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the resurrection, have in common. They enlarge our worlds. They expand our minds. They extend our reach into the lives of others. They reject our tendency to flatten the world and our experience of it. The man walking from Jerusalem to Jericho is beaten, wounded, left for dead. The religious people pass, pass by on the other side. Death is a part of life. The son, far from home, squanders his birthright, defaces his identity. That child is lost. A world is in the grip of a deadly virus, wreaking havoc on all of our plans, isolating us behind our locked doors, distancing us from each other. Along comes a prophet who contradicts all of this, who dreams the dream of God, a Samaritan bandages a wounded man. How unlikely. A parent embraces a rebellious child. How undignified. A discredited rabbi hangs on a cross. How scandalous. Where is all of this going? Embedded in these stories is a power a power to heal. We need that story of a power to heal, to reconcile, to roll away the stone, to bring life out of death. This master rabbi kept hinting at all of this, but our hearts couldn't absorb it. Our minds couldn't imagine it. Yes, he told us about all of this. Now that we think about it, now, Looking back, we remember. And so they go to share the good news with others because you cannot keep a good story to yourself. They go first to the authority figures, the apostles. You think the apostles, all men will believe the witnesses, all women? No, you would be right. It could be male chauvinism or insider arrogance, but it could also be that they do not believe because this has not yet been their experience. Paul, writing to some of the first followers of Jesus, asked, how can you say there's no resurrection from the dead? If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain, our faith is in vain. We're not telling the truth about God or ourselves. I'm aware that there are persons beyond the church and sometimes inside of it for whom the resurrection is something they can't quite figure out. It's just not within their belief structure or experience. Again, Parker Palmer tells the story of Lauren Isley, 
who was a renowned naturalist who once spent time in a seaside town. He was plagued by insomnia. He couldn't sleep very well, and so he would spend the very early morning hours walking on the beach. Each morning at sunrise, he would observe the townspeople combing the sand for starfish, which were washing ashore during the night, and they were gathering them for commercial purposes. For Lauren Isley, this was a sign, a small sign, of the way the world often says no to God's gift of life. But one morning, Isley got up as unusually early and discovered a solitary figure on the beach. This man, too, was gathering starfish, but each time he would pick one up, he would throw it out as far as he could into the breaking surf, back into the nurturing ocean from which it came. As the days went by, Isley found this man embarked on his mission of mercy every morning, seven days a week, no matter the weather. Isley named this man the star thrower, and he would later confess that this man and his pre-dawn work contradicted everything Isley had been taught and believed about evolution and the survival of the fittest. Here on the beach, the strong reached down to save, not to crush, the weak. And this led Lauren Isley, who was not a believer, to wonder, is there a star thrower at work in the universe? Is there a God who contradicts death? That's the Easter question. Is there a God who contradicts death? That's the COVID-19 question. Is there a God who contradicts death? Christians, by definition, are people who have experienced the resurrection. In some way or another, we have discovered that the tomb is empty. In some way or another, we have met the risen Lord. In some way or another, we've chosen life and not death. It's something of a puzzle sometimes, or a wake-up call, or a leap of faith. Sometimes it evokes a, a sense of danger or fear. We're letting go of something. We're in a process of healing. Maybe we started, have started walking back home toward our true purpose, and we're living in the implications of what this means. Words of Ken Callahan, hope is stronger than memory. Salvation is stronger than sin. Forgiveness is stronger than bitterness. Reconciliation is stronger than hatred. Resurrection is stronger than crucifixion. Light is stronger than darkness. And so today, Christians across this troubled planet celebrate, remember, bear witness to this experience, the resurrection of Jesus. It's a contradiction. And like the apostles at the beginning, there are many within and outside the church who can't quite believe it. And yet when Christians gather together, we are in a mystical sense, we are the risen body of Christ. Paul, writing later to the Corinthians in words we've read, at the graveside expresses it. It is sown a mortal body. It is raised a spiritual body. Through baptism, we die to self and we're raised into a new life. Through communion, we eat the meal and come become for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Through service, we participate in the great mission of mercy reclaiming a starfish here and a starfish there. Through study and worship, what we're doing right now, we tell these stories, the same stories, over and over again. 
Stories about healing and reconciliation and eternity. About what it means to love our neighbor. What it means to be family. And finally, what it means to trust the promises of God. We are the Easter people. We are the people of hope. We are the star growers. And we believe with all our hearts and minds that there is at the heart of the universe a God who contradicts death. This is the good news for us, the Easter people, in this year of COVID-19, on this Easter Sunday, 2020. He is not here. He is risen. Thanks be to God. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Together we have raised our voices in praise to Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Redeemer. He gave it all so that we could live. Today we celebrate his resurrection. Hallelujah, Jesus is alive. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me,
Easter people, raise your voices. Go into the world to shout your hallelujahs, to proclaim that Christ is risen. Proclaim it to your friends in, through text messages. Give them a call. Maybe even post it on Facebook. Declare that Christ is risen all throughout the world, all throughout cyberspace. And as you go forth with hope in your heart, knowing that the Lord is the Lord of life, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. And may you know that he always holds us in the palm of his hand. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us go with hope. Amen.